Genomics, it's just part and parcel of oncology treatment today. It should be a part of a patient's evaluation and record at every point in their cancer journey. Even if a patient's genomics might not affect the current choice of therapy, it may do so in the future. So it's important, and it's important to have it documented. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we're talking with ONS member, Kristen Daly, nurse practitioner at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, about what all oncology nurses need to know about cancer genomics. Kristen recently presented on the topic in her session, Applications in Tumor Variants in Clinical Practice at the 2022 ONS Bridge Conference. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Kristen. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to have you today on our podcast. I listened and in and I loved your session at Bridge. So I had this great content and I'm so glad we can share this with our listeners as well. Oh, thank you so much. So let's start off. Why is it important that nurses understand genomics and keep up with the latest advancements? Genomics and precision medicine is changing how we practice so rapidly. It's hard for everyone, physicians, nurses, and other members of the healthcare team to keep up. While this is wonderful for our patients because they are able to access the most appropriate and focused treatments quickly, it's an ongoing challenge (laughs) for oncology nurses and APPs in order to keep up with what seems to be often weekly changes in treatment. And you're so right. I mean, I sometimes I think back I didn't even learn any of this stuff when I first started in oncology because like it wasn't around. Maybe that's showing how old I am, but <laughs> but like this wasn't even a thing. And now it's suddenly it's everything. There's just a lot for all of us to kind of learn and sort of get on top of in a hurry. Advances in genomic research and knowledge, even in the last five to 10 years, especially, particularly in areas of oncology like lung cancer, very particularly, have increased rapidly, leading to more types of testing, ways to categorize cancers, and types of treatment. We have moved from the distant past of one-size-fits-all treatment to therapies becoming more and more specific for each patient. That being said, continuing education is and has always been a normal part of our role as oncology nurses, whether formal or informal, Because oncology has always been a field with sudden changes in practice in response to evidence. It's just with the advent of genomics and precision medicine, these changes are coming even faster and can often result in multiple changes for treatments both within and across different types of cancers. Precision medicine, genomics, and biomarkers aren't just buzzwords or trendy new terms. They are the tools that enable oncologists to continue to refine and improve what we have always striven for in oncology care, the continual and ongoing search to provide the most appropriate and crucially the most effective treatments for our patients. The use of genomics and biomarkers is just an evidence-based expansion and extension of our previous care. Oncology nurses are experts at quickly adapting and incorporating new knowledge into their care for patients. Although there's a lot of new information coming at us, I always try to remember the saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Indeed. And sometimes the first bite can just start with what words we're using to talk about the topic at hand. That's a great place to start when nurses are new to this realm. So let's talk about those key terms. What are some of those as you mentioned a few already, those buzzwords or these new terminology that nurses are hearing, what should they learn about those terms to better understand genomics? The first question I would be asking as a new nurse or a nurse or an APP new to oncology would be, what do these terms mean? 
So first, I want to talk about genetics versus genomics. What's the difference? Are they different terms? And they are. So genetics is the study of inheritance. So inherited changes, changes that can be passed on. And genomics is the study of all of the genes and gene products in an individual and how they interact with one another in the environment. I think that a major misconception, both in oncology nursing, but certainly in the public, is that people think that the majority of cancers are inherited, when actually that's not true. Only about 5 to 10% of patients with cancer have inherited changes that are the cause of their cancer. So the majority of patients have acquired changes that then have led to the development of cancer. And so that's why the focus on genomics is so important. Pharmacogenomics, for example, is just how an individual's genes affect an individual patient's response to a particular medication. So this is part of all of the research, which is influencing treatment choice in response to an individual's genomics. So it's really just pharmacology plus genomics. So what's precision medicine and precision oncology? It sounds pretty snazzy. It sounds like a buzzword in the way it is. What it is, is the process of determining the optimal treatment for a patient based on his or her genetics, environment, and lifestyle characteristics. All of those things together. The last term that I want to define is biomarkers. I think it would be hard to escape the term biomarkers. It's in all of our scientific literature. You see it in general media as well. Very hot topic. So what exactly is a biomarker? It is a gene, a protein, or another substance that we can test for that's specific to a patient's cancer which provides information that helps us design and refine that patient's treatment or their surveillance so that it is more effective and targeted. So the key is the biomarker has to be measurable. We have to be able to detect it, test for it. It has to be specific. It's specific to that patient, that patient's cancer. And it has to be currently or potentially, in other words, they're working on it in the lab or the clinical trials available actionable. We have to be able to do something about that biomarker. So that's really the key right now with biomarkers. Important to note that you'll see biomarkers for all kinds of diseases. They're looking at it in acute COVID. They're looking at it in chronic and other acute illnesses. Biomarkers are not specific to oncology, but for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're just talking about oncology biomarkers. These are all broad terms, which is good because they're inclusive terms with room to grow, but I know they can kind of seem vague when you're first presented with them. What exactly is that? It's hard to sort of get really a handle on what specifically they might mean until you become more comfortable with them. I like how you've made that parallel in that biomarkers are everywhere and we've actually known them for a long time. We've been working with biomarkers for quite a while in oncology. Maybe we just didn't call them that. And so it's really just choosing terms and deciding sort of as a profession across the clinical professions to like use the same words to talk about the same thing. So we clarify and eliminate any confusion. So yeah, I mean, biomarkers can feel new, but I think that we should be confident that we actually know more about this than maybe we give ourselves credit for sometimes. Absolutely. I completely agree. Biomarkers are something we've always used. Nurses, HER2, ER positive, P16 and head and neck cancer, KRAS. We know so many biomarkers that have been familiar, EGFR, to nurses who've been practicing for years. We just didn't call them biomarkers. But as we've learned more, biomarkers helped us and help us Focus those treatments more specifically for patients. We've always known that there are some patients who respond better to some treatments than others. And as we learn more and more about these biomarkers, they help us identify who those patients are. So we already know as oncology nurses about biomarkers. That's the other thing, exactly your point. You're already using them. We're just adding more of them and learning more about the ones that we have already been familiar with. Absolutely. So we've already kind of alluded to this a little bit, but can you briefly explain what is the gap in knowledge for genomics present among kind of the average oncology nurse? You know, what's the gap we need to bridge in that knowledge base? 
So as we've already noted, there's so much information about genomics and resultant changes in practice happening so quickly, it can feel overwhelming sometimes. This influx of information and advancements in treatment will necessarily create a gap in knowledge. However, there's no way to completely keep up with all of the changes in genomics and honestly, all of the changes in treatment in general, not just genomics, and the result in advances in cancer therapies. But that's a good thing because it means that we are constantly improving. We're not standing still. That's wonderful for our patients because they'll be able to receive more and more effective therapies. However, this is more than a gap for new nurses. All nurses graduate as generalists. So a new oncology nurse, they might have been lucky to have even one clinical rotation on an oncology floor and generally only very basic formal teaching on oncology topics. Our healthcare colleagues, especially our physician colleagues, are often not aware of our nursing training and curriculum. And therefore, sometimes they're unaware of both our strengths and gaps in our knowledge compared to medical training especially when we enter a specialized area of nursing like oncology. An anecdote I like to give is when checkpoint inhibitors came out, they were approved, and the next week we were giving them, and there wasn't a lot of time to have education, and I provided some education about immunotherapy-related side effects to our nurses. And when I was speaking with my physician and at least one other physician, They said, oh, well, they got all that information about them in immunology in nursing school. (laughs) You laugh, but they didn't. I said, no, we don't get immunology in nursing school. And literally, they both were like, oh, yeah, they do. And I'm like, hi, I'm a nurse. (laughs) We do not. And that's a gap. Like, they just don't know. They just were making assumptions. And so that's another gap. It's a gap between our healthcare colleagues' knowledge of what our formal training has been and our formal education has been and the kind of care we're supposed to provide and understanding the science behind that care. So that's a gap. They're making assumptions sometimes and therefore gaps result and may not be filled unless we're very conscious of the fact that there are that sort of miscommunication or not full awareness of, again, what our education has involved. Also, a new oncology nurse may only get six to eight weeks of training on the floor or in his or her practice area before going out on their own. Now, some institutions have formal fellowships or training programs in oncology. I was an educator for the one at my institution in the past, but many do not. So training and education can be haphazard, especially with short staffing since the pandemic and with many experienced nurses living direct care. Our experienced nurses, in many cases, who were repositories of knowledge at the bedside and treatment centers and in all aspects of oncology care may no longer be there, which is a huge loss as a source of education, particularly for newer nurses. As I think of all the information that you've just described and The challenge, I mean, as a new oncology nurse 20 years ago, we had a handful of chemotherapy agents and pretty similar side effects across the board. And now if I were a new nurse coming into oncology, we now recognize that cancer is not a singular disease. We've known that for a long time now, but it truly, every diagnosis is different. Every treatment is different. And so I can't even imagine how overwhelming it feels for brand new nurses to come into oncology. But as you've mentioned, with the pandemic, with our current staffing shortages, what was once you know a specialized field that you, maybe you didn't go into until you had maybe a few years of practice under your belt, this is now a, an entry level specialty that we're welcoming and excited to have new nurses join. But it just it enhances that huge learning curve of just, oh my gosh, there's so much information. Where do I start? And then you also think if you're in a generalist practice or a community setting where you're treating all cancers, and so you can go from one biomarker and one cancer type to the next from patient to patient, versus if you're maybe in a subspecialty practice or an academic setting where you only focus on one tumor type you know, all day, every day, just the variations and what your knowledge needs are and how to bridge that gap I can identify with how overwhelming that must feel for nurses who 
whether they're new to nursing or just new to oncology, that's just a hard door to enter into. We want them to, we need them, and we want to welcome those new nurses. So I think we experienced oncology nurses need to do what we can to not only teach ourselves, but then to think of how we can support those nurses coming to join us so that they don't get so overwhelmed that they feel like they can't make it. Absolutely. I mean, it's so important to support each other as oncology nurses, but especially our newer nurses. They're trying to learn so much of a new role at the same time as they're trying to keep up with these, as we've said, rapidly changing treatment recommendations and guidelines. So all of us who are listening to the podcast, all of us who are practicing, we need to provide them with opportunities for learning wherever and whenever possible and the tools to help them access the information they need at the time they need it. And we're obviously, that's part of what we're talking about today. <laughs> right. Well, and even as you, as you mentioned with your story about the, just the misconception of what training nurses get in their programs, you know, there's a great opportunity, I think, to partner with our physician colleagues, our advanced practice colleagues, our pharmacists, so that we can learn from each other and not be afraid or somehow embarrassed of what we know or don't know and just recognize that it's important for us all to have an understanding that helps us support the patient. So hopefully those are opportunities that nurses can explore at their own institutions to just to make sure that they are tapping into any resources they have locally. Right. Absolutely. One of the things I always, I think has served me well, and I always try to remember is that no one has ever learned anything without asking a question. And asking a question could be literally asking a question, looking something up, but that has to be the starting point. And I always ask questions. Probably my colleagues might say sometimes too many, but, you know, I ask a question every day. I look for something, for some information in my practice every day because I need to. Again, I think it can be hard, particularly when you're new, but even if you're not new, to ask that question, to seek out that information. The way I often explain it is I usually flip it around on nurses and I'm like, do you mind when anyone asks you a question? And they're always like, no, I love to teach. I would love to share that information. And I'm like, so if you don't mind, why do you think they would mind? So, well, we probably certainly can't cover every point to be taught today, but as you said, part of our talk today is to hopefully help bridge a little bit of that gap. So what are some of the overall key points about cancer genomics that oncology nurses need to know? So I think we've covered a lot of them with the terms, but a big thing I really want to make sure that people understand, as you've said, it's not something new. It's just an extension of what we've always done in oncology. Genomics is just another and rapidly expanding, which is why we're hearing so much about it, tool that we use to determine more specifically what the genetic drivers are for the cancer that has developed in an individual patient. What is driving that cancer to grow? Determining those drivers with the help of genomics, biomarkers, precision medicine, as we've discussed, enables us to recognize and choose the most appropriate and effective treatments for that patient. You've already been using and aware of genomics in your practice with the biomarkers we mentioned before, even if you didn't call it genomics. How have these advancements in genomics affected practice for every oncology nurse? Genomics, it's just part and parcel of oncology treatment today. It should be a part of a patient's evaluation and record at every point in their cancer journey. Even if a patient's genomics might not affect the current choice of therapy, it may do so in the future. So it's important and it's important to have it documented. And I think that's a great point because sometimes when we do get those results back on whether it's their genetic testing or information about their somatic test results from their tumor type, that information may not be acted upon immediately, but it just builds that information that can inform and hopefully direct therapy at some future point in their care. And sometimes it's important for patients to understand the importance of gathering that information up front, even if that does create a short delay before we can initially start in a treatment. Having all the pieces of the puzzle together from the beginning, as you've mentioned, can make sure that we're picking that most precise and appropriate treatment for each patient. As we've addressed some of the knowledge gaps and just challenges that nurses have faced in learning all this information in a hurry, what are some of the factors that you think contribute to the limitations in education and training for nurses? The easy answer is time, time, 
and time. That is always the major factor is we don't have enough time. And whatever role we are, we are extremely busy. So finding time for that. And as we've discussed previously, short staffing and the fact that many experienced nurses have left direct patient care roles during the pandemic has had a real and direct impact on the ability for nurses to learn on the job and from their colleagues. In a January 2022 survey that ANA, American Nursing Association, did of over 12,000 nurses, at that time, over 52% of nurses surveyed said they were thinking of leaving the profession, and 89% said their institutions were experiencing a staffing shortage. In addition, during the pandemic, restrictions were imposed by organizations, which limited access to in-person educational opportunities for many nurses, and those effects are still being felt, and many of those restrictions are indeed still in place. So now many new oncology nurses, they have less time and training, fewer opportunities for in-person education, and fewer experienced nurses to serve as mentors and sources of knowledge. All of this coupled with that increased pace of change in treatments for a variety of cancers. So keeping up and staying current is, I know, particularly challenging in these circumstances. And I have to say, I am always so impressed by how oncology nurses come up with solutions, share information, and seek out opportunities to learn in order to take the best care of their patients. You're absolutely right. As nurses, we get it done. Somehow we find a way. But certainly, as you've mentioned with all of those statistics of the status of kind of how the nursing workforce feels and the challenges they're faced, it does just impress upon me the importance of finding a solution and trying to create ways that we can bring this information to nurses so that they can find ways to incorporate this into their practice, into their days at work, or even on their own, you know, on their own personal time to an extent, because it is their profession. And there's something to be said for investing in, in your own learning and your own advancement, even if you're not technically on the clock. But I think there's a balance there that certainly I hope that things improve over the course of the next year. What education specifically do you recommend for nurses you know, to start with to better understand the genomics? I'll start more generally, all kinds, but it's important to know what type of learning works for you personally. How do you learn best? It's usually a mix of methods. I like to attend live conferences, but that's not always possible for me or others. And I sometimes need information quickly. I like to listen to podcasts in the car. I like online courses, et cetera. So really evaluating what works for you. So we all have different learning styles and different time pressures and conflicts. People may have young children at home or other personal and family responsibilities that limit free time. I know how many demands oncology nurses have on their time. However, one good thing that has happened as a result of the pandemic is the increased variety and access to virtual and on-demand education and classes. There are also some wonderful tools I'm going to plug here the ONS Biomarker Database. Full disclosure, I am one of the dozens of oncology nurses and staff at ONS who has worked on this, but I also have to honestly say there is no way I would spend the amount of time I have spent working on it if I didn't think it was a valuable tool. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but there's also other resources that nurses can use to help them navigate this environment, but they don't always know how to access them. So please spread the word and share your favorite resources, some of the ones that I'm including, but the ones that have worked for you. So again, the Oncology Nursing Society Biomarker Database, which is at biomarkers.ons.org. Importantly, no ONS membership is needed. You just have to set up a free account with a username and a password. Now, as a nurse in direct care, this is where I would start to find information about a specific biomarker, for example, and a specific cancer and targeted therapies. You can look things up by biomarker and tumor type, type of targeted therapy. And the important thing about this to me is that it was designed for oncology nurses and APPs by oncology nurses and APPs. We are presented with so many tools that people tell us that we're going to love that are designed by people who don't do our job. So this is designed by us for us to be a focused tool. I know people don't have a lot of time. I know if people have to do more than three clicks and they're out. This is very useful. It's a unique tool with a great deal of information in one location. Not all cancer types 
have rolled out yet. It's a gradual rollout, but I would absolutely bookmark it. It's optimized for phone and tablet as well as PC. Bookmark it in your phone. Again, you don't have to be a member to access it. Another ONS source that I like is the ONS Genomics Taxonomy. So it has a lot of definitions of terms as well as links to so many resources. I'm going to be honest, I use it a lot. And we'll link to that in the show notes, I'm sure. Just look up ONS Genomics Taxonomy. ONS also has the Genomics and Precision Oncology Learning Library. So many tools. There's multiple resources, online articles, journal articles, podcasts, clinical practice resources, patient teaching tools, videos, etc. It is a great place to start just for searchable information. And that's the other thing. It's nice to have a place where you can go to start for searchable information. Use each other. Don't reinvent the wheel. We do that all the time, only to find out that someone else had a source, has developed a tool. There's so much knowledge around you if you just reach out to your colleagues, as we said before. Institutional resources. So you may not have access to journals or other sources of education, but touch base with your clinical educator or whoever has that role at your institution about access to programs and resources because they may be able to let you use their access. For example, I didn't realize that at my institution, it's affiliated with our medical school, that I could get journal articles from our medical school library. And that was very helpful to me, not just in terms of my learning, but at several points when I was trying to get approval for medications for patients, and then I had to attach journal articles. See if you can use the resources of a school of nursing, if your institution is affiliated, or if you're an alum. Just check it out. You may be able to access those resources. Local ONS chapter meetings and conferences. I'm also biased as I am a former past president of my local chapter in St. Louis, but we really do try to provide education. That's a major part of what ONS does. ONS is here for oncology nurses and education is a huge part of that. National conferences like ONS Congress or ONS Bridge or in the specific area of oncology in which you practice. ASCO and AS, which are national, they're physician conferences, but they often have nurse tracks along with APSHO for advanced practice providers. ASTRO is for radiation oncology, the Society for Neuro-Oncology, the Society for Gynecological Oncology. I could go on. But if there's a specific cancer type that you are practicing in, there are often conferences and they often, as I said, have nurse-specific tracks for education. They may be in person, but there may also be a virtual component. Ask if your institution is planning to send nurses to any conferences, to these conferences or other conferences, and if they'll sponsor you. You might be surprised. And even if they can't send you this year, you could always say, well, I can't go this time. Could you maybe put me down so I could go next year? ONS Foundation has scholarships for attendance at ONS Congress. I would also look into, again, for those institutions and other places that we just discussed, if they have scholarships. Often they do. And I know from talking to people who organize some of these conferences, sometimes those scholarships go begging because people don't apply for them. So many great options you've provided. And it's clear that there's a lot of resources out there. But I think to me, the one thing that I stuck out the most and I think is just can be the most impactful is sharing what you find. If you find something cool or just really helpful to you or information that, man, I didn't, I've never heard it that way before and that really helped it click, share it with your colleagues. Maybe they got it already and they don't need it. That's okay. Just being able to share the great resources, the webinars, whatever it is that you found that you thought was helpful, sharing it with your colleagues helps kind of bring up the whole team together. So I think that that's great advice, not especially the biomarkers database, which I think is a really great tool that you know, when we've talked to nurses about what they need, it's just like, just give me the facts, just get down to the point. Like, I don't have time to read 20 pages, like, just give me the highlights. And I think that the database does a great job of giving you links to it, see the full picture, but at the same time, just drilling down to what you need in the moment in clinical practice when you have patients in, in clinic or in the room down the hall and you need to find something to help refresh your, your knowledge base on what you're dealing with. I think that the database is a great tool for that. Absolutely. I agree. And as you said, what we're doing today by talking to each other, too, is exactly that. We're sharing these resources. I have benefited from others sharing for me. So that's why I always say spread the word. And you also mentioned, of course, the learning library. One thing that's in there that I really enjoy is 
There's a free course. It's about an hour long, but it's called Genomic Foundations for Precision Oncology. Talks through a lot of the stuff we're talking about today, but again, sometimes hearing it again or hearing it presented in a different way can make it stick better if you have a certain learning preference or a, a way that helps information kind of you can absorb it and, and take it in. So I would encourage everyone to check that course out. It's free for members and non-members alike. And so that might just be another resource that you can tap into for yourself or your colleagues. If you feel like you still could use an information kind of on a primer on the basics of precision oncology. So are there any other specific genomics tools that are available that you would recommend to help nurses? Well, obviously the ones we've just mentioned, and we'll provide links to sort of the following ones I'm talking about, a lot of online resources, a lot more than I think people realize are out there. So Medscape Nurse Education, and these do come with continuing education credits, and we'll have a link to that site as well. You can filter by type, topic and the length. In other words, how many CE credits would you get for it? So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, which is network of 32 centers nationally, including my institution, that set many of the guidelines that we use for our oncology treatments. I think people are familiar with the guidelines, but they're not actually as familiar with the fact that they provide education as well. It's free to join NCCN, you just have to give them an email and set up a password. Now, one thing I do recommend, particularly for younger oncology nurses, is that when you set that up, use your personal email, not your work, because, you know, life happens and you may not be at the place where you're working right now forever, but you may want to have access to that. Another area for education, source and resource for education, is the newest of the National Institutes of Health the National Human Genome Research Institute. So it's NHGRI. It's the newest of the institutes, as I've said. It has great educational information, both for healthcare providers and patients, and great teaching materials as well. Something that I use a lot, I find very helpful. The National Cancer Institute has several dictionaries and other sources. So their Dictionary of Genetic Terms is very helpful. They have a Dictionary of Cancer Terms and a drug dictionary. So we'll have links to each of these, but I definitely use those. They're very useful, very concise, as you mentioned before, Jamie. So they have concise information. Sometimes you just need a term defined. You just need a quick highlight, as you said, on a particular question. There's also a nice genomics for disease treatment and prevention. And this is also an NIH article, and I'll have a link to that as well. And I think that that's very useful, just sort of general information to help sort of understand the underpinnings of everything that we've been talking about. So now that we've equipped nurses with a million different ways to find education and resources, do you have any recommendations on how they can incorporate or implement these tools in their actual practice? However and whenever you can, while you're working or outside of work hours, again, with the understanding, I know how busy people are. It's important to make it a priority to set some time aside regularly for continuing education, however you do that. Like I said, I listen to podcasts in the car and to use these types of tools. And if you find websites that you find particularly helpful to just bookmark them on your phone, on your computer, so they're easily accessible and to share them with other people. This has been such a great conversation. Even when I think I've got this down, I always find myself learning something new or picking up a new trick along the way. So thank you so much for your time today. As we come to the end of today's podcast, there's just a few final quick fire questions I'd like to ask just to kind of help summarize what we've talked about. What are some common misconceptions about cancer genomics? I think the main one is, as we have talked about it, that it's something new. It's not. It's just a continuation and an expansion of what we've always been doing, seeking the most effective treatments for cancer. What is something about this topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? That it is overwhelming sometimes. It can feel overwhelming because of the rapid nature of change in oncology. But there are resources, tools, and education out there that are readily accessible and can be helpful. Also, even if a patient's genomics doesn't determine their current treatment, it may affect future treatments or the number and or the best sequence of treatment options available. 
And I think that's not something that's often discussed. So it's not just helping us find the best treatments, but sometimes when to give that treatment, in what sequence, all of those things are determined by genomics. And it can make a big difference to the patient and not just their effectiveness of their therapy, but their quality of life. What additional training or resources do oncology nurses need to understand cancer genomics and incorporate their knowledge into their everyday practice? I think it's the training that is available that we've discussed. That is going to be in flux, but we've already discussed the fact that there's more than people might think. I think people are often surprised about how much there is available once you sort of know where to go look. What we all may need to know today will be different in even a few months. So rather than focusing on specific training or resources, I think that nurses need to incorporate ongoing education into their normal practice, just in whatever way works best for them. I kind of see it as like a game of Tetris where it's like you have to build a foundation on that bottom row as the pieces fall down. And then as the new pieces come, you try to put them in a place that makes sense so that you can connect it to the information you already had. So play that game of Tetris with your genomics. (laughs) Just make sure you always have a nice green education piece in every game. That's right. That's right. You got to fit it in just perfect. Fill in those rows. Don't leave any holes. And then finally, what are those highlighted resources that patients and providers could use if they want to learn more? So the ones we'll link here, sometimes industry-sponsored programs can be helpful, particularly when a drug has been very quickly approved. We may not have as much information about it. Asking relevant questions of our physicians and other healthcare colleagues. Package inserts can actually be very helpful. (laughs) That's something that can be quickly accessed online journal articles, online presentations and videos, et cetera, et cetera. Well, again, thank you, Kristen, so much for great discussion today. Lots of information, lots of links we'll have in the episode notes to help send nurses off in the right direction when they're ready and wanting to learn more to incorporate in their practice. Do you have any final comments for our listeners today? I do. I think we've made it clear genomics is not going away. It's going to continue to be a key component in making treatment decisions for all oncology patients that you know more than you think. And you can be a resource for others as well as using your colleagues as resources. There are tools out there that you can use and education available, whether bite size or in more concentrated form. Learning about genomics is important for all of the reasons that we've discussed, but because we have to keep up with our patients. We have to be able to help them filter and understand the information they may get online. For example, we had a patient who came in to see us who had done massive research and were very interested in a clinical trial for patients with a specific biomarker, but they didn't understand that it was only available if you were a certain stage of cancer. So we have to help people incorporate that information and understand it. Again, oncology education about genomics is just going to be part of being an oncology nurse today. But honestly, education has always been a part of being an oncology nurse. And we have tools and education that can help fill in knowledge gaps, provide new insights, and make connections between pieces of knowledge that you already possess. Well, thank you again so much for your time and all your information that you shared with us today. Thank you so much for having me again. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.